Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Benoit, and I am an al Hi, y'all. My husband used to say, if you have a hard time remembering my name, Benoit, just take the V off. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, well, he's dead now, so. (laughs) Thank you, Lee. That was great. I used to be really hot, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> oh, look at those pictures. <laughs> I want to thank Lee and this really amazing committee. I mean, y'all are really amazing. You, I mean, you, you have literally grinded out every dime of our plane ticket, right? I mean, we haven't sat down all day. Come over here and talk here. Come over here and do this. Come over here. Fix this. Oh, come on, come over here and do this. Hey. I am. And as a whole, and I don't think I'm lying, but as a whole, I think this has been one of the best group of sickos that I've been around (laughs) in a long, long, long time. I mean, y'all are on it. I mean, you're just everywhere and you're doing stuff and you're arguing and you're carrying on and you're screaming at get him off, get him off. (laughs) Which reminds me. First of all, I need to make amends to the convention or the committee. I somehow and I got this all screwed up. I don't know how. So I didn't come in. I didn't fly in until 9.30 last night. So I missed you. I will get hopefully your tape. I've watched you all day and you're, <laughs> you're way sick. And I, <laughs> and I have to leave at 6.30 in the morning. So I'm so sorry. I don't ever do that. I come early and stay late. I like to be around alcoholics. I, I do. So. Saying that, I, when we got here, I needed to kind of calm down, so we went to the talent show, or whatever you call it. <laughs> Is Ron here? <laughs> Are you single, Ron? <laughs> huh? Are you? Yeah. Is Nikki here? Is Nikki here? Is she single? (laughs) (laughs) I am I am not going home with the grand prize of the night, which was a I mean it was great, wasn't it? Um it was a bowling pin and it been painted and I saw that and I fell in love and I wanted it. So Leave and I put a show together. We choreographed it, we sang, we were full of energy, knowing that we were gonna win it, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> and we did uh I'm a little teapot. We did not win. We had a standing ovation. We were the only ones that had about six standing ovations. <laughs> but when the voting came, here was little Nikki. <laughs> I'm not bitter or anything. It's all right. <laughs> Evidently, you hadn't got to the page where it talks about rigorous honesty. <laughs> I've had a good, good time. Y'all are just great people. And uh, I have two home groups, actually. I, I'm a member of the Unity Group in Denton, Texas, and I'm a member of the Stepped Up Group in Los Angeles. And um, you're invited to either one of them, and 
Anytime you're in either one of those places, give me a call and I'll get you to a meeting. I am sponsored uh, and I sponsor. And I have committed meetings and um, I love I love this fellowship. Let me tell you, I got nothing. There's nothing up here. Uh, I said my thank yous and I'm, what do I do now? <laughs> There you go. <laughs> See how they just tell you have an audience? They just get up here. I have one story, and that's it. Somebody said, you want to make up something a little different? No. Uh, I love alcoholics. I love them. Uh, I want to be around them. They're very exciting. I figured that out a long time ago. Didn't know they were alcoholics. I just thought they were exciting. I like the bad boys. Uh, anybody that went, you know, was nice. Oh, they're so boring. I just, I, they didn't have anything for me. Um, I have, I had three brothers, my mom and dad. I was the third child, the only girl. Uh, my oldest brother broke his neck when I was really young. And that bankrupt my father, just bankrupt him. And we became the poor category. And we got... Th hand hand me downs and things, and there was a my brother before his accident was a lifeguard at uh, the local boys club, and uh, because of that, and so many people knew him, and because our Lubbock was really teeny tiny then, where I was born and raised, Lubbock, Texas. Um, they had an article on the paper about him on the front page down at the bottom, and it it said, "Father swallows pride and asks for help." Now, I was too young to know exactly what that meant, but by the, here I go, <laughs> private joke, um, but I knew it was something bad, because the look on my daddy's face, I knew it was something bad. My daddy is from Oklahoma, he's part Indian, and he was just a good man, quiet man, full of pride. His handshake was his bond, and um, a good man. He married my mama. She was from Bramfield, Texas. And uh, I found out later they kind of ran off together. She was, it was on a dare, and she didn't particularly like daddy, and she didn't. I love what you said. I'm a Swede, and I told you I loved you before we got married. If I change my mind, I'll let you know. I love that. <laughs> and my daddy never said, I never heard my daddy say, I love you to anything or anybody, but you knew it. You just knew it. And uh, the fighting at my house was unbelievable. The smells at my house were unbelievable. My brother was nearly dying, you know, over and over for years, and they brought him home, and and they didn't have anything modern. This was back in the 40s, so everything was just, it was not pleasant, and I didn't stay home. I stayed out in the streets all the time. And when I say the streets, you know, I was this high, but I was out there playing, and uh as I grew older, um, because because we were different, I I just kind of stayed in the background. But I ran around with some older women, and I guess they were 17 or 18 or something. And they took me out to the most gorgeous, glorious place. I still think it is today. Uh, a honky-tonk. <laughs> it was called the 87 Club because it was on the 87 Highway. And we walked in there, and it was truly amazing, life-changing. I mean, it was enormously big and smelled like home. <laughs> <laughs> Rotting fresh, old flesh, old dried urine, cigarette stale, sawdust, just puke. It just... Smell like my house. So I felt like pretty much at home there. And there was a band playing, and the, it was loud, and there was people everywhere, and it was exciting. And I'm telling you, I, it was one of those jaw-dropping times for me. I just absolutely loved it. And it doesn't take you long if you have absolutely no self-esteem. You stay in the back. But I'm, I'm a watcher. I observe, and I learn how to do things. And I watched the older girls, and they would watch the bar over there. And when the, about 11-ish, when the guys started kind of stumbling and falling off their stools, 
they would kind of catch them in midair and take them out on the dance floor, and they would dance. So I figured this out pretty quick. I didn't know I could dance. Let me tell you, I was hot on that dance floor, too. I mean, I could, I could do it. But I didn't know that either till the first guy asked me to dance. And it was a slow dance, actually, called Sleepwalk. Do y'all know Sleepwalk up here? I had some of the women are going, because they, you know that Sleepwalk. It is an in, a guitar instrumental, and it goes into your soul. It goes into your bones. It goes into your breathing. It just takes you away. I'm quite sure probably like an alcoholic takes a drink. It just takes you away, and it changes you. And this guy asked me to dance. Now, he, I mean, he liked, he was pretty drunk, and he liked to cuddle on that dance floor. And I had never, and I'm no, not unique about this. I mean, if you grow up in alcoholism, this is not unique, but I used to think I was. Nobody had ever hugged me. I was never tucked in bed or rocked or anything. And I had not had, as far as I could remember at that point, feeling of another human flesh on flesh and this guy had it right here his cheek and he was nuzzling and we're going to that music and he has me I mean he's hugging me sugar I mean I'm hugged (laughs) and it kind of goes like this And you just like, <laughs> and he's right here, and he says, "Now listen up." He says, "Sugar, I need you." <laughs> I never knew how to describe that until I got in the program. And I heard, her, heard a speaker say how awkward he was and how awful he felt and stumbled around and had pimples on his face and blah, blah, blah. And then he took a drink. And the drink went down here and went boom. Come back up and he grew arms and muscles. Oh, he was a man and he just could face the world. Well, when he said that, boom. <laughs> yes. I had hit the mother load. I mean, I tell you, I was so excited. Well, we'll get married pretty soon, and uh, everything is going to be wonderful, and this is this is it. This is fabulous. And um, I don't remember if we went to his house or my house, but um, I had a spiritual awakening that night. <laughs> and much like the alcoholic, I'm going to say this real quick. I hope I don't lose my place. But I have all the characteristics of an alcoholic. I don't have the allergy to the body. So a lot of things that we talk and hear about all the time, I have. I understand it. Not to the depth that you have it and not as long as you have it, but I have it. There was a friend of mine, an old timer in Oklahoma City, and he said, (laughs) Manoi, <laughs> if you'd suck on a sour apple, you'd flip to the other side, you know. <laughs> and that may be true, but I am not an alcoholic. <laughs> I woke up with guilt and remorse, like an alcoholic does, because my grandmother was a Baptist. And I did I did not go to church. My families didn't go to church. I there was nothing in my house that I saw any evidence of God at all. If God was not anything anywhere in the scope or on my radar. But my grandmother was a Southern Baptist, and some of you may know what that means. A Southern Baptist is you can't, if you dance, you're going to hell right there. <laughs> if it whizzes through your head, you're going to hell. Boy, you really would go to hell. I mean just <laughs> You think it, you done it, and um, you if you laughed on Sunday, and I wasn't supposed to wear shorts on Sunday. You know there was a lot of rules, so I woke up thinking, my grandmother, I am going to go to hell. But at the time, I didn't really care. 
And I looked, and he was gone. I was with my house because he was gone. And I thought, what happened? What happened here? I thought I thought everything, I thought this was good. I thought I had a him. I mean, I needed a him right here. If I had a him, then y'all would see I'm worth something. And this guy, I had him. I had a him. And he's gone. And I was like, I was really hurt. So I was talking to the big girls. Now, come on, don't worry about it. We'll see him this weekend. We were weekend warriors. So we go back out there, and I didn't see him. But I realized this. The stools were full. (laughs) Smorgasbord over there. (laughs) So this time, I would pick one that would stay. And so we went. I, the whole thing. And I, the more I did that, the worse I felt about myself. And I would say to myself, you know, this this weekend, I'm just going to go out there and dance. I'm not going to do anything else. I'm just going to dance. And I could not not find a man. I could not not do it. I became a slut puppy hoe. <laughs> And I could hear people saying remarks about me as I'd go down the aisle to go to the bathroom or something. And I just got smaller and smaller and smaller. And one night this, um, finally, I mean, I had this group of women, and they were girls, 18, 19. And they kind of went on their way, and they got guys that stuck with them, and I just didn't. So I was kind of sliding over to this table. This is about the table I'd see out there, I'm sure. And... (laughs) This table started going to the bloody bucket. The bloody bucket didn't open till 2 a.m. And you met some of the finest characters out there you have ever met in your life. I mean, it was marvelous. They called it bloody bucket for a reason. Uh, there was always a fighting, a stabbing, a shooting. A, you know, the tables flipped through the air. It was so exciting. I just, I, I loved it there. And we'd stay till nearly dawn and then leave. One night this guy came by and he threw a $100 bill on my table. Now, I'd never seen a $100 bill. I, I was just fascinated by it. And he had that swagger. I just love alcoholic swaggers. I watch y'all a lot. <laughs> and he said, here, run around on this a while. And took off. Well, I was impressed but kind of, kind of frightened because this guy was known to be halfway crazy and very mean. And he wore a shoulder holster, and he made sure you saw it. And he was one that was shooting around and about. (laughs) But that was all right. Uh, (laughs) He would be okay. I would help that boy, and uh, (laughs) maybe he could stay here. So sure enough, uh, we hooked up, as they say. We started having this meaningful relationship, and uh, I love the word. You know, I don't know who it was was saying today about the new new stuff, the social media, the Twitter and the twigging or whatever it is, and, <laughs> and uh, how things, you know, this generation is so different. They call it meaningful relationships and all that crap, and we just said, you're shacked up, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and I became pregnant. Now, this was the late 50s. You did not uh, have sex out of marriage. Nobody did, but me, I assume. (laughs) (laughs) And you did not get pregnant. It was the worst thing you could do to your family. And I was pregnant. And he took care of me and my my parents, they were just they were just devastated. I just stayed away from him. I'll never forget my daddy's look when I, I had to tell him. And I had my daughter, Tracy, and uh, in the hospital, he came and said, I've done enough, done all I can do for you, and you're going to have to move on, and um, left. And I was devastated, just devastated. And it was like, what were you thinking? I mean, really, what, you, what was you thinking? Uh, this is the way it's always been, so it's always going to be. So I took my little baby girl and, and went to this little place with some friends, and I thought, I'm going to show him 
And here's when some of my Al-Anon isms, if you will, the characteristic that makes me up. I'm, I'm I'm a controller, and I'm a manipulator, and I'm a user of people, and I have expectations of people, and I have a plan. And if you hurt me, I'm going to show you how much you hurt me. And it depends on the crime, how much time you do. And it's called vengeance. Venge- vengeful. I didn't think I was vengeful. I just trying to show you. And I thought, now he, this, this guy was a gambler, a professional gambler, and he had bootlegging. That's how he made his living. And he ran around with gamblers and just really, really bad people. But, you know, I didn't see that. They were exciting to me. And uh, there was pimps and prostitutes, and they called them boosters. They go stolen stuff, and you could buy it for, you know, a dollar or whatever. And that, this was what I surrounded myself by, because I fit here. It was okay here. So I went across town and got a guy that he hated. The guy, I helped the guy get drunk quicker, faster. I fed him more whiskey than he normally drank and kept mixing it, kept conjoling him till he took me out to the bloody bucket, which was such a stupid thing. And it didn't turn out well, but we got out of there unscathed, and people came in to surround us and said, what are you thinking, and got us out of there. And, and this guy was so drunk, he didn't even know where he was. Two days later, uh, my friend knocked on my door and said the gangster had taken a shotgun and blew this man's head off. And I, you know, I just, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't happen. That's movie stuff. That That's not real. That doesn't happen. He didn't do that. And she was telling me this, and I remember it was dawn, and you could see the sun coming up. And all of a sudden, it was getting really black all around me. And I had a pain that started in my chest that was so horrific, I could hardly stand it. And it was going up in my throat. And I just stepped back, and I took a deep breath. (sighs) Well, that's too bad. I stuffed it. I stuffed that so deep and so far that it took years for that to ever come to sunlight. And it was all over everywhere. It was all over the TV and the newspapers and uh, radio. And and uh, it, they were going to make a example out of this. And I, I, I just, I couldn't believe it. I, I didn't want any of that to happen. I just didn't want him to leave me. You know, he could treat me any way he wanted to. Just don't leave me. Please, don't leave me. And so I did all this stuff just so he wouldn't leave me. And it cost a life. And I was so, yeah, I just didn't know. I just didn't know. And I went to my mother's house right after that, and the screen door was locked. And I made on the door, and she came to the door. And she said, we don't want you coming over here. We don't want our neighbors to see you come in and out. And if anybody asks if you're our daughter, please tell them you're not. And I said, okay, Mama. I understood that. That did not make me feel bad. I did. I mean, it didn't hurt my feelings. I just knew it was the right thing. And I said, okay, Mama. And I just turned and left. And uh, the blackness came for just a second. And I stuffed it. Well, here I am. I have uh, no family. Uh, some of my friends scattered from me because it was a horrendous thing and a lot of notoriety. And I thought, what am I going to do? I've got to do something different. I can't keep doing this. What can I do? It was about the time that some people were burning the American flag, except the cowboys. You know, the cowboys didn't do that. And uh, if you went to the rodeo grounds, you could hear real red-blooded, all-American, decent guys out there. So hmm, I went over there. This is it. I'll get a cowboy, and he can be here. And he's decent, and I'll be decent, and everything will be all right. So some, a couple of my new friends and I, we went over there. And this is the deal. They had the rodeo, and uh, then there's a slab, a concrete slab out here outside the arena. There's a fence around it. There's a band at this end, and the drunks line up on that fence, and we land on this fence, and we watch till about 11-ish, and they start falling off that fence. <laughs> The only difference was 
they wore cowboy hats. <laughs> he wore a pistol. And I got the bull rider. He was a bull rider. And he was built. And he was handsome. And he could dance. And, I mean, I got him. I got him. He was darling. My friend Jim Williams, some of you may remember him from way back, he used to say, if you line ten pretty girls up against the wall, he'd pick the sickest one every time. I said, Jim, you don't understand. The sickest one on that wall takes a step forward. They come after you. You don't pick them. <laughs> we come after you. And so I picked this cowboy and got him. We were somewhere and doing something and arguing about something. And he was poking me in the chest. I picked up an empty quart beer bottle and I hit him over the head, which was not unusual. Um, we hit each other, slammed each other, threw each other. I've been pistol whipped. I've been shot at. I've been, I got the top of my ears gone. I've been thrown in, moving cars, out of moving cars, you know, just, I, just whatever. I'll, come on. Come on. <laughs> and I just not I sent him to his knees with that quart beer bottle. And I thought this is not a good idea. So I ran and I went outside headed for my car and he grabbed me and he caught me and he spun me around and he said, I think you've just knocked some sense into me. I think we should get married. <laughs> Do you hear that? Married. Married. I had not ever thought about marriage. I didn't even ask that gambler, you know, we've got a baby coming. Let's get married and, and give this baby a, a good start in life. We can get divorced later, but let's do this for this child. I never even thought about that. It never, you know, it never crossed my mind. And I never thought about marriage. When you, when you live the kind of life that I did and was, you lose, I lost all of my dreams. There was no dreams left for me, ever. That I was going to be married. I was going to have family. I wasn't going to succeed. I was going to be just what I was, just what I was. And I wasn't much. And I knew I wasn't much. And he had told me, you were a piece of garbage and I picked you up and don't you ever forget it. And I believed that. I did. So when he said married, good gosh, I kept that boy drunk on uh, tequila, salty dogs, in a big court till I got everything arranged. <laughs> <laughs> And I went over to my girlfriend's house and propped him up against the wall and got Jake, who was just drunk as he was, and propped him up to be his best man. We had a justice peace over there, and we got married. <laughs> and really, really, really had a great marriage. I mean, I had all the dreams. Here I can bake cookies, I can make little kitchen curtains, and he can mow the yard, and we'll go to PTA. This is it. And it was a great, great marriage for the first six days. <laughs> and then the soul sickness started seeping in. His and mine intertwining and fighting and hitting and banging and the soul sickness came. I had this little girl watching all this up. And then we got pregnant. I had a little boy. This'll stop him. This'll happen. And it didn't do anything. The only thing it did truly was give me some company at the window at the night. I quit going out to those places because there was nothing but hell out there. I thought if I would start one of my manipulations, if I start staying home, he'll stay home. Uh, I, I'd go out and I'd catch him and they, the, that the bouncers knew to watch for me. Because if I slipped in, and I'd, I'd flip your table straight up in this air because I was going after I hated blondes. <laughs> I mean real ones, you know.
they was always taking my man out there. And I just got where I couldn't go out there. I couldn't go out there and get in that. So I stayed home and I pretended it wasn't that. I had these two kids. I would get in bed and I'd see him coming or hear the pickup, you know, six miles down the road. And I'd jump in bed and I would lay on the side, just getting as close to the edge as I could and lay very still and breathe deep, hoping he'd think I was asleep. And most of the time that didn't work. He'd come in and the brawl would start and my kids were hiding in their room and under their beds and in their closets. And I didn't think that ever happened. I just didn't. And one Thursday, I was sitting in my rocking chair, and he worked out of town and came in on weekends. I had two busted lips, I mean, two uh, two black eyes and this huge busted lip. You know how horrible they look when they come up and go up your nose? Maybe some of you may not, but the real women in here do. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, I cannot do this again. I just can't. Um, what am I going to do with those kids? I had nobody left. I mean, there was nobody. The neighbors even wouldn't let their kids come over. They'd shoe them. It, it was really a nightmare. And I thought, I'm I'm just going to take a bottle of pills in there and sleep. I just want to go to sleep. I want to sleep for a long time. I don't want to really kill myself. I just want to sleep for a long, long, long time. And then I thought, you know... There's no one, absolutely no one to take these kids. Nobody. What in the world am I going to do? I had nothing to fall back on. And all of a sudden, the big book has the word sudden in there so many times. And one time there's just sudden is a word in the period. Sudden. All of a sudden, I got a thought. I remembered an article I'd read in Ann Landers in the newspaper in her column. Some woman had written in about a drunk husband, and I thought she said call AA. And that's what I did. I picked up the phone. I called Alcoholics Anonymous and talked to this man. And he gave me a, no, I think she called me. And um, this woman invited me to her house, and I went over there. Now, all of that sounds real quick and simple and easy, but you have to understand, for somebody like me, I didn't call anybody. I didn't ask you for help. I don't need your help. I'm fine, thank you. I can handle this. Back off. And people did. And I just, oh, okay. And I went over there. And she took me in her house, and and her husband came in later, and I got up to leave when the man came in. I got up to leave. She said, no, that's it. it." And he came in, and he sat down, and he started talking to me. They were both sober members of AA. And that's extremely important for me to always remember they were sober members of AA, and they didn't poo-poo me off or turn me away because I was an al They took me into their home, and they told me about what was going on with them, and they told me about their recovery. They told me what they were doing, and they said some things, you know, to me that gave me some hope. And we made arrangements for them to take me to a meeting. So they picked me up and took me to a meeting. I had no idea what Alcoholics Anonymous was, or Al-Anon. You know, back then, it wasn't on, <laughs> there was no treatment centers. There was no Oprah or Jerry Lewis or Jerry, whoever he is. There was none of that. <laughs> Everything was quiet and secretive, and it was just nothing. And it was a very moral, horrible, horrible thing to be alcoholic and have your family like this. So they took me. And when we got there, he got out of the car, and he came back behind the car. He opened her door and came up to me, and I was already out of my door. And he said, oh, and he slammed my door. And then he walked to this clubhouse, and he opened the door, and I was kind of behind him. And he held the door open, and he stood back, and he looked at me. And I'm looking at him. I thought, what is he doing? Why didn't he go in? And he's just standing there. And finally he goes, I thought, oh, my God, he is mistaking me for a lady. He (laughs) thinks I'm a lady. Oh, my God. I just was stunned. I'd seen Rock Hudson and Doris Day do that, but I'd never seen a man ever do that, ever. 
and I stepped in over the threshold, and at the end of this big anti-room was a cigarette machine, an old cigarette machine. Had the little packages of cigarettes on cross here, and they were all lit up, and you put a quarter. <laughs> <laughs> and these two guys were leaning across there, and they were talking, both of them talking and laughing. And I mean laughing. I stood still. And I was looking at them because that glow from those different colored cigarettes were on their face and they were laughing. And I hadn't heard laughter in so long. I was mesmerized about it because it was this clear, it wasn't a ha-ha or, you know, it was laughter. I'm sure it was joy, joyous. And he urged me on in. We went to the al meeting. I'm sorry. And she sat me. Now, she had never been to an Al Anon meeting, ever. She never went to another Al Anon meeting. It was several years before alcoholics realized that they could come to an Al Anon meeting. But she came in there and she sat with me so that I would not be alone. From that day to this, if I spy a newcomer, I guarantee you, they're beside me in my chair, because I don't want them to feel like they're alone. I cannot tell. I cannot tell you what they said. I have no earthly idea. But whatever it was, I was hooked. And I, uh, is it already that? Jeez, I'm for not having anything, I'm really right now, aren't I? <laughs> so I speed this real up. Um, I, I got a sponsor, and that was not easy for me because I don't need help. And and she, um, you know, she does what sponsor does. She took me in, and her husband was Jack, and they sat and talked to me for hours. And they, she walked me through, and he told me about. <laughs> They told me about alcoholism and what they were doing and how their life was. And, and I, I just, I got that hope. Maybe there's some hope. I didn't get in there too deep, but maybe there's some hope here. And they started taking me to all the things. I, 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 the saddest thing happened the other day. I was talking to this new girl, and she's, you know, she's just, she's just not ready to come. But she says, you know, I can't do all this extra stuff you do. <laughs> like, come to my house and let's read a book. Um, <laughs> they got me in the car and they took me to conferences and conventions and they took me to different meetings we one time we rented this the group ran this bus and we drove down to um uh, big springs texas and we went in there and we took a tour and we took a meeting and then they took us back where the uh, wet brains were. They don't do that anymore, I don't guess, do they? Uh, the, and these guys were feeding the wet brains, and we got to watch that. And I saw the most incredible, unbelievable love from those sober guys feeding those wet brains and loving on them. And it was just the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. I didn't know anything like this went on on the planet. I just didn't know. And I changed, and I was different, and I was, you know, moving. And now I got this little cowboy at home, this drinking little cowboy, and he's not happy about what I'm doing at all. And on that bus road by ride back, um, Johnny Brooks, my sponsor's husband, sponsor Johnny Brooks said, "You know, the first thing he's going to do is accuse you of having a man because you're happy, and he's not seen you happy." And he's going to accuse you of that. And it wasn't three days till he said, what's going on down there? He's always down there. And um, hired a private detective once to watch me. Now, that is the funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and he tried to stop me from coming here. And if you're living with a practicing alcoholic and know this, it's extremely difficult. But he said, my sponsor told me, if you don't come here, you're not going to have a marriage anyway. If you don't come here and leave your kids with babysitters, those babies are not going to have a mother. 
And so this is the most important thing you'll ever do. And so I continued. And uh, we'd been, I, 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 we were talking about this, I think, at the table today. At lunch, or is this today? Is it still? I mean, uh, and he was violent. And one of the guys said, have you ever asked him not to hit you? Uh, no catch him in the morning when he's sober and talk about this and so I did Uh, we talked about several things number one the hitting and the sex and I told him I love you but you can't perform and and I love you and I don't want this and I cannot I cannot have you hit me again these kids don't see it and I don't deserve it and he, he went pale. Now, he's a drinking, violent, mean man. He said, okay. And he didn't. He stopped all of that until I think it was five or six. I've been in the program five or six years. And I was asleep way at the back of the house. The kids are in the front of the house. He opens the door, and he flips on the light switch. And by the flip of that switch, me way back there, I heard it in the house Something happened. <coughs> Something was in the air. The atmosphere changed. And I knew hell was on its way. And I was trying to get out of the bed. And he was back there. And I know in five seconds, he jumped in the middle of that bed and started just beating the crap out of me. And I was trying to get away from him. And I got tangled up in the sheets. And I, so my head, I slipped off in the bed. And my head hit the floor. And when it did, it bounced up like this. And in seconds, there was my two children, and they were just dancing jig. Daddy, Daddy, please don't hit her anymore. Please don't hit her anymore. And I'm telling you, it was like somebody took a curtain off. Oh, my God, my kids see this. My kids hear this. My kids are hurting. Oh, my God. Because I'd send them to the back room and shut the door. They didn't see, so they didn't know. I found out many things years later about my my darling baby girl and boy. And so I left. Now, one of the reasons I hadn't left before that is I don't know why. (laughs) I don't. Ask an alcoholic, why are you drinking? They don't know why. I don't know why I stayed in it. I don't. I was going to leave as soon as, as soon as the bills got paid, as soon as the cars paid off, as soon as I get some money, as soon as, as soon as, as soon as I was going to leave. And uh, this was the day. And so I left. And, you know, when you're ready, God just takes care of you. Uh, I was a high school dropout, and I knew I was uh, uneducated. What was I going to do to support these kids was one of my fears. And boom, 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 boom. AA and al showed up, and boom, 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 I was in nursing school. And I graduated. And my class asked me to give the class response. I'm standing up there at this church just full of people. And over here is about, I don't know, the whole front bunch is, is my bunch. My AA and al people. And right in the middle of them is my mama and my daddy. And my daddy, I looked down and I was thanking the families for helping us get through this. And my daddy looked at my next door neighbors that they had invited. And he said, and he pointed, he said, that's my kid up there. And, you know, uh, you told me how to do that. You told me how to fix that. You gave me the directions and I followed them because I wanted to. And all that got mended. My father died and I was able to take care of him. My mother died and I was able to take care of her. Magic. Everything was fine. My daughter started. You know, I put her to bed one night. She's playing Barbies. The next morning when she got up, she was an alcoholic. (laughs) (laughs) The war was on. I mean, the war was on. I mean, she was. I heard you women talk, and she wasn't going to do that. You hear me? You're not going to do this. And so, well, you know the end of that story. She's out and about and gone. And then my little son one day... um, he wasn't home, and his drunk cowboy father, we'd, of course, divorced by now, uh, had kidnapped him and took him off, and I didn't know where he was for three days. I was just frantic. And 
He called and said, I want to stay with my daddy. I'm okay. Boom. Well, I went to my sponsor, and I was just devastated. And she she told me to write an inventory on my motherhood, which I did. And we took a fifth step on that. And this is what she told me, and this is what I learned. I had been a bad mother. So many areas. I had been a bad mother, and I had to own that. I had also been a good mother in many areas, and I had to own that. And what was going on was the disease of alcoholism and the disease of alanism in my home. That's what was going on. And she said, God has no grandchildren, none. He knows the past of your kids, and it's going to be okay. She said, go to a place that you can turn them over in your mind to God in your prayer and meditation. And so I did. I went home and I started praying and meditating. And I remember a time that we I had started going back to church and I found a church that worked for me and I took my kids there. And they asked, if you need some prayer, you can come down to a kneeling rail. And so I went down there and uh, when my son asked me to, we went down there to pray for his cowboy daddy. And I remembered how how good that felt. There was these lights and they on our shoulders, and and we prayed and for their daddy. And so in my mind's eye, I took my kids down to that altar and I left them there as much as I possibly could. Until this day, when I get in trouble, that's where they are. <clears throat> We're down there. So the kids are gone, and I'm free, and I'm out running around, and I'm at these conventions, and I meet a man. <laughs> He's sober. And uh, he's good looking and he has diamonds everywhere. <laughs> I can't tell you which caught my eye first, but. <laughs> so we started dating. He lived in California. I lived in Texas. It's one of those things. And we decided to try to, he was going to move me out there, get me an apartment. My, he was all set. I had to have an apartment because we would have, we would do it the right way this time. And I, I didn't want to do it anyway, but the right way. So he's going to rent me an apartment. I was going to get a job, and we were going to be in the same city to see if we could have a relationship. And he <clears throat> he got scared, fear, fear, fear. And at the last moment, he dumped me. I mean, dumped me. I had quit my job. I had given my furniture away. I had everything in a U-Haul trailer, and he was one of my friends was going to drive me out to California. He was on a cruise, and he was coming home and catch me there, and he I got off a plane. I'd been off to this convention saying how wonderful God was. And uh, I was fixing to go to California. And <laughs> there he was, and he dumped me. And I was just devastated, completely and 100% devastated. Now, to make a very long story short, I was mad at God. I wasn't mad at Jim. I mean, you know, I know what I am. What was I thinking? What was I thinking? And... <clears throat> I started my old sluppy puppy hoe ways within the AA club. I'll show you God. And I hated myself for it, but I couldn't help it. I was thinking I was doing something to God, I don't know, and I got caught. And I was at a conference with my sponsor, Brownwood, Texas, and, and I got caught there. And uh, she said, come with me and we went out on this blanket, and it was like midnight, and the stars were out, and it was a cool night. I'll never forget it. It was a beautiful night. And she said, what are you thinking? What are you doing? And I said, well, I just feel like God's betrayed me. I did everything he asked me to do, everything. And he just betrayed me here. She said, oh, do you think you ever betrayed God? Now, I don't know why. I heard that, and I felt it, and I understood it. And I started crying from the bottom of my toes all the way out. And I said, Pat, there's something about you, about me, that you don't know. One of the questions today was, what was your favorite memory of your sponsor? This is my favorite memory of my sponsor and shall be for all time. I said, Pat, there's something about me you don't know. I've never told you. I've never told anybody. I didn't want it to come to light. But this is a truth about me. I am unlovable. I don't know why. But I'm unlovable. People come into my life, but they leave. And I'm unlovable. And I was sobbing, and she reached over, and she got me, and she put my head on her shoulder, and she just started rocking me and patting my hair. And she said, 
that's not true, Benoit, because I love you with all your warts. And if I love you with my human love, can you imagine how God loves you with his love? And I, I, I got that. I got it. And I went back and I swore that any time God asked me anything, I was there. Okay, whatever it is, I'm there. Whatever you need, I'm there. And I feel like I have to catch up. I don't think I'll ever, ever pay back for what I've gotten. And um, I know I have five minutes because I watch real careful. <clears throat> Today, my kids, Jim and I did get married, and we did have a great marriage. We had to hammer it out, I'm telling you. We were like two atom bombs going off in my house until we figured out how you're supposed to be married. It took a while. And uh, we we moved. I was in California, and his shoulder hurt, and we looked at it, and it was cancer, and he was he was dead in three months. And I realized we'd been embezzled. I had nothing, nothing. And uh, I looked around in my family, and here's what was here's what was going on. My daughter got sober. My stepdaughter got sober. My son, uh, I had hardly anything to do with him till he was a grown man. And he was drinking. I didn't know how much or whatever because we didn't see much. But then we started seeing and going back and forth. Now, today, my daughter my daughter had 10 years of sobriety, and she had to slip. She came back a different person. We were really close and loving, and but when she came back, it had changed. She got sober for two and a half years and had another slip, and it just changed. And it, I had to eventually step away from her. For uh, She's sober. She's going to have 15 years. She's married, uh, but I had to step away. Her daughter, my granddaughter, is uh, sober. My uh, son, this is how God works. When I could not stay out in California anymore because we'd lost everything, I decided to come back to Texas. And my friends in Denton, Dallas, said, come stay with us. My son had been in Indiana for 20 years, and he got transferred to Denton. We both got there the same week. He saw this, found this. We were gonna. He was going to buy some land. I was going to put a little house on it, and we were going to be happy. Well, he met this blonde <laughs> yeah <laughs> and she swooped him away so he got married now he's 46 she's 42 a couple years ago and he had no children and god gave us a little boy it's just amazing my son goes to cowboy church and he his whole conversation is yep Nope. Maybe. That's it. <laughs> and he got real friendly with the pastor. And the pastor was going to be out of town and ask him if he would talk, preach, if you will, on on this Wednesday night. Well, my son was just petrified. But he knew that he had to do it, so he did. And I went. And I watched him. And I saw him so nervous that he could hardly get up there. And then I listened to him. And I had heard tales about how he was touching the young men in that group and of that church and how they just flocked to him because he had something special. And I watched and I watched. And I was watching him, and it was like I had an out-of-body experience seeing my son up there. And God said to me, See, his life was none of your business. I needed everything to happen to him that happened to him because I've got something I want him to do for me. And this is part of it. There's no blame. There's no fault. He's mine. Well, I just, um, we went, we always went to dinner after church and I, and I just broke down and cried and told him, I said, my heart has always been black and, and I've, I've really healed a lot of it, but I have scars and every now and then they pulsate. But tonight I saw you and I know. In a couple of, I think a month later, it was Mother's Day and he sent me a text, no card, but he sent me a text. <laughs> And he said, I know you think you were a, a bad mother. You are not. If you will look at us, you will see people of God and people of honor and people of trust. And that's all because of you. You help so many other people. I am so proud of you. I would have not have picked another mother. And I'm always grateful that you're my mom. Let me tell you. If I never got another thing from y'all, that'd been enough. But it just keeps coming and keep coming and keep coming and keep coming. Um, my stepson finally got sober. 
I'm out of time, but I do have to tell you this because I made a promise to somebody. Uh, Bob White, who was a, a big leader in our part of the country in West Texas, started everything. He's this gracious, wonderful man. And, and one of the joys of being a nurse was that I got to take care of people. And, and he got cancer. And Marcy called me and she said, can you come? And I went and uh, stayed with him and helped take him. And I, I came back from a convention and I said, He had been the first speaker of a conference called the Canyon Conference that Jim and I started, which is in a church camp for AA now and on women. He was our Sunday morning speaker. And that morning he said, we close every meeting with the Lord's Prayer. He said, pray it and listen to it. It starts off with our Father. And then it says the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. So any school kid, said he, can figure out if there's a king and he's our Father, that means makes us royalty. We are prince and princesses of the kingdom. And the power is in this room. It just, you feel it. You can feel it. If you don't feel it right now, you'll feel it Tuesday or maybe two months from now. But you'll feel the power that's in this room. And the glory is God himself. He comes down. And I just love that. He said, claim your heritage. Treat each other like royalty. And so I told him when I came from that convention to keep him for a week, I said, I told your story this minute, and he said, promise me this. Promise me you would always tell it. So I closed my talks with Bob's story, and I'll tell you, it's given me my purpose in life. It's given me my, I, I know who I am, and I know what I am. I am Princess Vinoy. I'm a child of the king, and y'all gave me that. I will be eternally grateful. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.